Health for the start of the technical sessions of this one day national seminar on G20 New Delhi Leadership Declaration, role of Indian Academia in formulating world order. The first session is going to be on human centric development and healthcare, where uh, we're going to have a very eminent uh, speaker. It's a proud privilege to introduce Professor Anandan Krishnan, an eminent surgeon for excellence by presently in the Dean Mahatma Gandhi Medical College and Research Institute for the Chedi. Professor Anandan Krishnan started his career as a faculty in the Department of Surgery in Jitma from uh, 1977 and served in various capacities as director and professor in the Health Department of Surgery in Jitma and uh, also he served as uh, director of Indira Gandhi Medical College and Research Institute for the Presently, he is the dean of faculty and the professor of evidence at Sri Balaji Vidya Peet Pondicherry. He is recipient of several awards, published more than 50 research papers, and edited nine books. He has half a century of experience in teaching medical students, both UG and PG. With such experience and expertise, there would be no better person to speak on human health centric development in reaching the master. Sir, the stage is yours. Please, sir. Good morning, and let me start by thanking the Vice Chancellor and the <coughs> members of the organizing committee of for uh, this great university for inviting me to participate in this uh, seminar today. It's a great honor and a privilege to share my thoughts about the role of Indian academia in promoting the goals of the G20 Declaration, the Sustainable, sustainable Development Goals and see what we can do to contribute towards taking health to the masses. Because that is essentially the reason that or the purpose of our existence in the fertility of medicine. I've had a very long innings in, in academics and medicine and I'm very glad to see the number of young people in the audience and uh, you are the ones who are going to take the course forward and at the end of my talk or at any time in the middle if you want to interrupt me please feel free to ask questions so that I know at least that some message has got to the audience. As you know that the G20 meeting took place in New Delhi and as a result of this, they brought out a number of declarations called the Sustainable Development Goals for the world to adopt towards improvement of the world order as our Honorable Governor said just now. Three of those are what concern us in the health profession. And I am going to focus only on those to see where we were, what we are doing, how well we are doing it, and what we need to do in the future to see that we reach what was intended by the G20 declaration. The Sustainable Development Goal 3 says promotion of health and well-being. Not only health, mind you, the second word is equally important. Good health does not always translate into well-being. So it's health and well-being. Quality of education to provide doctors who can promote good health and well-being.
hopefully at least 80% of them are functional. That's what the regulatory agency says, which comes to 10 and a half lakhs. We have 5.7 lakhs of practitioners of alternate systems of medicine which goes under IOS. Combining this two, as health providers, the government of India release figures say that the required ratio of 1 is to 1000 as suggested by the WHO has already been achieved in India and our ratio is 1 is to 800 and not. But if you take only the practitioners of modern medicine, then the ratio is still 1 is to 1400 and we have some distance to go before we reach 1 is to 1000. But when we talk about ratio, we must remember ratio is one thing and spread is another. A ratio of 1 is to 1000 does not mean that everywhere in India the ratio of doctors is 1 is to 1000. As a country as a whole, it is 1 is to 1000. And we know that 70, 75, 80 percent of doctors are concentrated in tier 1 and tier 2 cities and 70 percent of our population lives in the rural area. So the ratio in cities may be well better than 1 in 1000, the ratio in some of the villages will be near zero. So we must not attach too much importance only to ratio but to distribution. And if distribution is to happen, there are three ways of doing this. One approach is the approach of the regulatory agency and the government is to start more and more medical colleges with more and more students, hoping that by overflow they will trickle down to the villages. Because the cities will not be able to stand that many doctors and provide sustenance. So that is the policy in starting more and more medical colleges. But we know it doesn't always happen like that also should happen. More and more doctors need, more and more doctors in cities, and very few of them go to villages. For various reasons, and we know the reasons for that. So unless there is a method of ensuring equitable distribution for meeting the sustainable goals by having perhaps a period of compulsory work in villages before you come to the cities, Increasing the number of seats alone will not achieve the target of equitable distribution or meeting the target of providing services to the people at their doorsteps. So that is one deficiency we have to face head on and see how they are going to tackle that. Not only how to create more doctors, but how to create more doctors who will be willing to go to villages and provide healthcare there. The second is as per the national statistics, we have 0.53 per 1,000 beds. One bed for every 2,000 population. It works out for a population of 140 crores for about 7 lakh beds. If you take that as the available number of beds, and you calculate the services required by the other healthcare professionals, the nurses in the allied healthcare workers, we have 35 lakh nurses. And I have given you below that the ratio recommended between beds in various units and nurses. Starting from 1 is to 2 in ICU, 1 for every 2 patient, and so on and so forth, 1 is to 4. So working on the mean of that, you will see that we have enough nurses because that works out to about 7 lakh beds for our, our population and 7 lakh average of 3 is 21 lakh, we have 35 lakh. So one will be inclined to say that we have reached the target for nurses. No, that's not correct because what is the recommended bed strength for the population as per WHO now? The best countries in the world are Germany and Japan, where it is 30 beds per thousand population. And the WHO recommendation is 2 to 3 
not 0 0.5, 2 to 3. So if we need 2 to 3, 6 times what we have, then we need not 20 lakh nurses but 1.2 crores. So there is an enormous shortage not only of doctors but also of nurses. When statistics are put in such a way that these figures are not obvious to us, we start thinking that we have enough. But when we compare to the requirements, we do not have enough. So it's not enough if you start medical colleges alone. You need a lot more nursing colleges. Because they are the people who provide service at the most times. Doctors always don't provide service at the most times. And when you come to allied healthcare workers, it's even worse, only 15 lakhs. If you go to any emergency situation in the US, recently my granddaughter fell down, fractured her bone on bone. She went to the hospital. She's seen only by a physician assistant. My son is a doctor, but he cannot get a consultation from another doctor. They have to go to a physician assistant who will take an X-ray, who will interpret the X-ray, who will immobilize the arm and tell the child to come after two weeks for an appointment with an orthopedic person. Every care at primary level is provided by physician assistants. So in our country, in our country we have to do that. If you have to do that, we have to create a huge channel of physician assistance. <coughs> and you see the number of allied healthcare workers see only 13 lakhs are there registered. They are the ones who provide first aid and I'll tell you all the services they can provide if we have enough of them. So again, if we have to get healthcare to the masses, it's not enough if you train doctors. You must have a lot of nurses, much more than what you have now. Six times the number you have now, and ten times the number of allied healthcare workers that you have now. But we do not see that happening. That's why I am raising the issue. The purpose of academicians is to give a feedback so that this message goes across to those who make the decisions, so that the decisions can be influenced. What has been happening in the last few years, particularly since the last 2019, I'm sure some in the audience of these must be doing medicine. And you know the changes which have happened in the curriculum in the last four years. Medical colleges have now increased to 700 plus. But as I said, that does not by itself translate to enough doctors. The number of undergraduate seats in medicine used to be about 60,000. Now it is 110,000 all over India. The number of postgraduate seats used to be 30,000. Now it's about 65,000. To that extent, we have almost doubled the number of doctors under training by increasing the number of medical colleges. How it has affected quality, I will come to that in my subsequent slides. Then it was realized that no point in producing numbers, we need to have competent physicians. Therefore, the National Medical Commission in the year 2019 brought out what is called the competency-based medical education curriculum. In that book, which is runs into about 2,000 pages, three volumes, 2,884 competencies are listed for a doctor to acquire by the time he qualifies in five and a half years. Not one or two, 2,884 out of which 125 need to be pre-certified before they are allowed to appear in the final exam. 
Then they found that attitude, ethics and communication requires attention because if you see the conflicts between patients and doctors these days, in any place where there is an encounter between the two of them, the conflict is always not so much about the quality of treatment but about communication. What they have been told or not told by the doctors and that is the cause which causes a lot of irritation to patients and relatives. So the NMC said, and these are good for maintaining the sustainable growth. There should be a special module for training in ethic, uh, attitude, ethics and communication. That's called the eight com module. The next thing which should happen and which is happening is, 99 out of 100 students who join medicine, join medicine because they want to become practicing clinicians. <coughs> they are not joining to become anatomists or physiologists or biochemists or pathologists. Unfortunate but true. Therefore, if you have a system where they go to the clinical scenario much after admission, that is not serving the purpose. You are demotivating them by keeping them in the labs and the basic sciences for a long period of time before they go to bed science. Therefore, the other thing which they said was early clinical exposure. From the day of admission, they must be taken to villages, meet the community, find out what is the community needs, how they are managing the health, and that is how they will get motivated. That's a good thing. That's what has happened. Then they have done, for the first time since independence, they have defined what is an Indian medical graduate, desirable Indian medical graduate. All this I am getting because this contributes to taking help to the masses. I'll tell you that Indian medical graduates. And recently you saw the NEET examination, the cutoff was reduced to zero because there were a number of seats which went unfilled and therefore government felt that seats are getting wasted. And therefore you want all seats filled. But when you reduce the, when you analyze the vacant seats, hardly 1% will be in government institutes or institutes where the fees is low. All of them would be taken up by those who hold higher ranks and need. So the only seats which remain vacant after several rounds of counseling are those where the fees are very high. So therefore by lowering cutoff to zero and filling those seats, you are not creating a cadre of physicians which will go to villages having spent 20, 30, 40 lakhs per year in education, they will not be motivated to go and work in the villages. So that is a conflicting thing which is happening in providing the manpower. We have to take care of these things. Otherwise what will happen is another 10 years will go by and the goal will remain a goal and we will not achieve that. The Indian medical graduate is now given five attributes for the first time. He should be an efficient clinician. He should be a lifelong learner. I'll tell you an incident which shocked me when I came across that. He should be a good communicator with patients, relatives and other healthcare workers. He should be a professional with proper attitude and ethics. And he should be a leader and member of the healthcare team. And to do that, they have listed 35 sub-competencies which have to be taught and assessed before he can be certified to be an Indian medical graduate of required quality. Now coming to lifelong learner, that is where the issue lies. Do we teach them to be lifelong learner? And you may well ask, why do we have to teach them? Is it not enough what they learn in those five and a half years? I read a paper recently by an author called Denison. He is a social scientist. He said, in 1950, the doubling time of medical knowledge was 30 years. That is, if you pass your MBBS in 1950, you can join service, retire from service before the knowledge has changed. It will change only after 30 years. In 1980, 
it became seven years. So as soon as you pass your internship, the knowledge has changed. You have to practically relearn. In 2010, another 30 years later, it came to three and a half years. That is halfway through your medicine course, your already knowledge has changed. And in 2020, you will be shocked. The doubling time of medical knowledge is 73 days. Every two and a half months. Unless you develop this attribute of a lifelong learner, how can anybody cope with changes in knowledge? He will be providing only substandard treatment. That is why it's important to inculcate the habit of lifelong learner. And that is an area where we have never emphasized in our country. Very unfortunate. So I told you what has been happening for taking health to the masses. Let us see what are the issues with some of those things so that we can now address and give a feedback before this seminar discusses the role of the academia. What the academia should do to give a feedback on those issues. There are large numbers of students. When I joined, I was in Olympia Institute, only 50 undergraduates. Then I came to Jipmar, till I retired there were only 65 undergraduates per year. Now there are 250. Now, medicine is a subject that has to be taught in small groups. It is not a subject which can be given to an audience of this by a lecture, because that is not going to reach the minds of the audience. So while increasing the number of uh, students in order to increase the doctor-patient ratio, they have also increased postgraduate seats. But if any one of you are in medicine, you know, the greatest demand for post-graduation after they are doing MBBS is in clinical medicine and clinical subjects. Nobody wants to do anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, pathology, pharmacology. Then who will teach? Those are the people who teach. Therefore, if you go on creating more and more clinicians by increasing postgraduate seats, then there are no teachers. And even where there are seats, for the last five years, zero seats have been filled in many of these departments. All the seats are vacant because they are not taken by students. Even in national institutes, in Gipmar for instance, anatomy, they are not a single postgraduate for five years. Who will teach anatomy in school? And the National Medical Council has now said, non-medical teachers of anatomy, physiology are no longer permitted to be faculty. So you don't permit non-medical faculty and their medical seats are not filled. What purpose would increasing the seats serve? How will you make the Indian medical graduate who has got competence? You understand the issues. That is where academy has to give feedback. Mismatched teaching learning method or large group teaching. Whereas the need is to have bedside side. But nowadays, very difficult. Patients know their, their responsibilities. They also know their rights. Nobody is willing to be examined by a student. I have been in medical academia now. Day after tomorrow, I will be completing 50 years. In 1973, on 16th of December, I joined as a teacher. So, they are not willing to be examined. So, what do we do? We say simulation lab. I tell you simulation lab. And then now they said, if patients in your hospital are not willing to be seen, post them to districts for the postgraduates. When they go to district, unless somebody is assigned the responsibility of teaching them there, they just go there, sometimes they have three months holiday and come back. Nobody knows what they are learning in those district hospitals because the regulator has not assigned any responsibility. All these feedback needs to go. 
So no patience, we have simulations, we have mannequins to practice. No patients to take history, you have standardized patients who are usually unemployed ladies. You call them to the hospital, they are paid money, they are taught how to answer questions. This question will be asked, this answer you have to give and the students are made to do that and then you give them marks for doing that on simulated patients, including the final examination. But I tell you the difference between skill versus competence. Skill is putting an intravenous line in a mannequin. You have a small neonatal mannequin in the simulation lab and all the students come, they are given a needle, they have to put it inside and the vein has been filled with blood. So when they draw blood, you say that is skill. Is that competency? Competency is putting a needle in a baby who is crying, who is shouting, who is thrashing its limbs. That is the difference between skill and competence. So mannequins will serve some purpose, but mannequins will not serve the whole purpose unless and until there is access to real patients. Also, skill in taking history. A standardized patient is paid money, very happy, you ask a question, she replies. If you don't ask the question, she'll tell you this question you did not ask. Because she knows other people have asked that. But when there is an emotionally disturbed relative from whom you are taking history, the competency required is different. This is what is happening in the teaching environment. So we have to give a feedback to say that this has to change. Otherwise, increasing colleges and increasing fees will not serve the purpose of meeting good health and well-being. Now you go to the patients and ask, what decides whether your health care is good? They will say only three things. Access. Either it's available to me at my doorstep or close to me or there is a transport available to take me to the healthcare centre. If they are not there, then it is of no use to them. Who will go to their bedside? Who will go to the house? Not the doctors, only the physician assistant. But we are not focusing on training more of them. They are the ones who will take health care to the last mile. The next thing the patient says, affordability. Now affordability you know varies widely. It's not the same everywhere. We don't have a universal health scheme. We have some insurance scheme. Some people are eligible, some people are not eligible. Those who are eligible are covered, those who are not eligible are not covered. There are lots of clauses to be fulfilled before you become eligible. And there is no system of universal health insurance like they have in UK where everybody gets the same care. So affordability determines what type of care you get. And the third is acceptability. Acceptability means quality of care should be good. That means the outcome of these medical colleges should be good, capable and competent. I told you the difficulties in ensuring that because of increasing seats, reduced number of teachers, dependence on simulations and so on and so forth. That's why 9 out of 10 people who pass MBBS want to do post-graduation because they feel inadequate. 9 out of 10 people who pass post-graduation want to do super-specialization because they feel inadequate. 9 out of 10 who do super specialization want to go and do fellowships because fellowships is what will get them jobs in niche areas. So, dry numbers don't become equal to healthcare. That is the message I want to give. We have to do something to translate numbers into quality health. These are all the jobs which I myself witness physician assistants do in other countries. They are able to dress, they are able to evaluate wounds, they are able to give injections including IV injections. 
they are able to take history, record it. They can do basic examination, come to a diagnosis, ask the doctor on the telephone, get advice if required. They can send the investigations, collect the reports, pass on the investigation. And they can always give first aid, transport and all that. The most important thing is accessible at the door of your house or to the first point of contact with the healthcare system which we can never ensure for doctors. So if we have to ensure that we reach the target of health for the masses, the unreached and the underserved, it has to go through an alternate path, not through the conventional path that we are following now. Otherwise, it will never reach. Also, one of the attributes of the Indian medical graduate, member of a team. Because health care is a team job, it's not an individual job. But we never have any opportunity in the whole curriculum where all the health care professionals are taught in one classroom to show team responsibility. The nurses are taught separately, the allied health workers are taught separately, the physicians are taught separately. But when a disaster happens, they all have to work together. When COVID happens, they all have to work together. When a roadside accident, mass casualties, they all have to work together. So we must start, we must at least give a feedback to those who make decisions that the interdisciplinary thing is mandatory in medicine. It happens in all countries, not happening here. These situations I mentioned, accidents, disasters, national programs, implementation, health education, out, outreach in the community, all require teamwork. And unless they learn teamwork in the learning phase, they'll never work as a team. The doctor thinks he's boss and his only job is to give orders. The nurse thinks she's boss of the allied health assistant. That will never work for taking pass. I am focusing only on one issue because that was the topic given to me. And not just providing healthcare workers, but to take healthcare to the masses. And two words which Governor Ravi added today, the unreached and the underserved. Secondly, the Sustainable Development Goal didn't say health, it said health and well-being. Now, how to promote well-being? Now, this term, salutogenesis, very interesting how it started in, came into the dictionary. Soon after World War II ended, uh, Austrian Jew, Anton Antonovsky, went to all the survivors of the concentration camps. He wanted to question how some of them just died and some others were able to survive four, five, six years of concentration camp. What kept those going who could see the end of the war and come out and what made others give up everything and pass away? He said there's one difference. All those who died were focused only on illness, pathogenesis. And all those who survived focused only on one, one thing, that is salutogenesis or well-being. The mindset was important. And why their mindset was important? Because of this theory of coherence. That is, they understood what was happening. They understood why it was happening and they knew ultimately it will end, I will get over it. What is the relevance here? How to produce? You see, nobody comes to a hospital like they go to a movie. Everybody comes there in a depressed frame of mind. And the disease may be curable or maybe only subject to palliation. Not everything we can cure. So how do we improve that thing? That is where the role of complementary medicine comes. We cannot have an isolated modern medicine practitioner anymore. There are many methods of producing salutogenesis. 
one method take illnesses like stress take illnesses like depression or anxiety or even what you feel cannot be cured without medicine we have more than 100 studies in our institute people with hypertension drugs will reduce blood pressure will not reduce anxiety they need another approach to anxiety women who are giving childbirth music in their ambience reduces their pain even though you don't give drugs because you don't want to give them heavy drugs because it will cross the placenta and affect the child but we have these silos where we feel we are modern medicine and they are complementary we don't mix in our institute we have an institute of salutogenesis more than 100 studies have shown evidence scientific evidence to show how complementary medicine helps just music while you are drawing blood or giving an injection in the immunization thing prevents children from crying that's all you are doing otherwise one child crying 20 of them will start crying while they are waiting for that turn to get immunized. If any of you visit our institute sometime, I will be very happy to show you the Institute of Salutogenesis and Complementary Medicine. We have some publications, I will leave it with the Vice Chancellor and uh, I will request you please, sir, to please go through and uh, pass it on to those who are interested. One thing we don't teach in our curriculum, which is probably the most important, I told you already, lifelong learner. The other thing is, it's not only transmission of knowledge, it is creation of new knowledge, research. Research is what is going to drive the modern physician to keep updated. Whereas research forms 0% of MBBS curriculum training and research. Every other country is mandatory for undergraduate, except in India. We don't teach undergraduates about, the governor mentioned, 33% increase in patent filing. We don't teach undergraduates about intellectual property rights. How simple innovations can take, and show you some examples of that, how it can take it to the masses. You see this chart, it's very, very chart which will make us feel ashamed. In 1991, if you take all the medical research output in the world, as published in journals, USA was contributing 23%, China 0.33%, and India was contributing 0.23% of world output. 2018, which is the last year for which figures are available, from 0.23% we have increased to 2.16% of the world. We are now, today the governor said, we are the largest population in the world. 145 crores. We are producing only 2.16% of research because there is no focus on research for the undergraduates. How will you promote lifelong world learning? China has seen from 0.33, they have become 8.8%. And the USA has come down from 23 to 17%. It's time that we recognize this and not only transfer knowledge or interpret knowledge, but also create knowledge by doing research. That should become a habit for all undergraduates. Recently, I wrote a paper on the changing roles of a medical teacher. There are only six roles in the past, which are there on the left side. It is written in a famous article by a person called Ronald Harden. Information provider. We don't need to provide information. If you ask students from where you get information, all of them will say Google. Google is the information provider. Teachers are not information providers. Teachers are interpreters of information. Whatever Google tells, even patients when they come to you, they've already Googled and got all the data. You only have to explain what Google has told them. Role model, 
I don't know whether any teacher is a role model anymore or whether students want to be role modeling from their teachers. Mentor and facilitator, you can try, but it takes two to mentor. Assessor, yes, examiner, curriculum planner and resource developer by writing books and all that. But see the new one, clarifier of information, skill developer, because skill is what gets you employment. And then a lot of people with learning problems. That's why so many suicides in institutes of national importance every year. Because they cannot cope. They are there because they have been put there, not out of their own choice. And when they cannot cope, they just suddenly one day do the worst thing possible. So the teacher has to be a diagnostician of psychological problem and having identified, refer them to counselors so that they don't end up doing something harmful to themselves. Career counselor, innovators, researchers and creators of knowledge, team builder and motivator and promoter of lifelong habits. So the whole emphasis and education has to change if we have to take healthcare to the masses. Otherwise, whatever you do in terms of numbers will not work. This, our ancients had already said, and I was surprised to find this. They had already classified teachers into six types with six different words. Here, teacher we use for all those 14 roles. But in Sanskrit, they had told long ago, an adhyapak is one who provides information. An upadhyaya is one who creates knowledge. An acharya is one who teaches skills. A pandit is one who gives a deep insight, makes you understand application. A drishta is a visionary and a guru is one who awakens wisdom. Long, long ago they had said this. We are realizing this now. That these are all the roles we have to play, not only information provided. And the last part of my talk is about simple innovations and how they take medicine to the community. This was what was created by one of our resident professors in the dental department. He had a chair with just a board, not this type of board, but just a vertical board kept on the back of the chair because a dental chair, you know, costs lakhs of rupees. You can't take it to the village. In public health dentistry, he was taking it with a board there to the villages so that they can sit there and we can look at their mouth while they're leaning against the board. So we suggested two modifications. One I said, have a slider at the back so that you can make the board taller or shorter or tall or short patients and have an extension mechanism so that the top can be bent backward so that you can see the upper teeth also. This has been patented and this chair is now taken abroad. And this goes in our public health dentistry van every week to all the neighboring villages where healthcare is provided. Only a headlamp and this chair provides healthcare at the doorstep to all the rural communities surrounding us. That is how you take healthcare to the masses. Simple innovations like this. See this? The row of chairs available, you just put it there, the people come there, have their cavities filled and go. Which they can't do. They go to a hospital, they have to wait for three days, they'll get an appointment. On that day, the doctor may be available, may not be available, then they'll have a second appointment and then they'll go. Disasters. This is a kid developed by a student. By a student who was motivated to contribute. It just looks like a carry-on luggage with a handle. And when you open it, it has got wax for all the medicines. It has place at the back for the dressings. The handle can be pulled out and used as a drip stand. And you can give an IV line transfusion in the village to a person who requires. They don't have to come. This has also been patented. Made by a student, not made by anybody else. Because they are exposed and motivated to do this. You know, burns, burns, those of you who are in the 
surgical field will know to treat a burns is very difficult because lot of factors depend the surface which is burnt the depth of the burns the age of the patient and so on and so forth a simple app where you just shade the part of the body burnt you use one color for superficial burns another color for deep burns and immediately the formula will give you what fluid you give how much you give in the next 8 hours how much you give in the next 16 hours and how much you give in the next 24 hours all in the app made by us in the at balaji vidya by the students we give them the formula they make the app and this is available free on uh, google and people are free to download and use this is how you take healthcare to think this is made by a student in physiotherapy a foldable cot physiotherapy set for taking physiotherapy to the village because they cannot come here for minor aches and pain so it's not all that dark what i have said might have created concern in you because i started with the negatives but we start have to start with the negatives to know what we are doing wrong what has to be corrected so that then we develop the positives and that is the only way in a large country like us where all access affordability and acceptability are very very difficult that is the only way we can fulfill the g20 declaration and take healthcare to the masses thank you all very very much for your patience thank you sir on behalf of uh, all the delegates and uh, the faculty and uh, employees students of anand university we profusely thank uh, dr anand krishnan for a very elaborate and uh, enlightening talk on healthcare for reaching the masses uh, before uh, opening it for a very short discussion or interaction i came to my mind not as vice chancellor but as a plain citizen sitting in front of a very renowned and uh, light doctor one or two questions so you were talking about um, the depth of um, qualified competent physicians to treat uh, the masses as far as uh, the situation is um, assessed by as a plain individual this is not happening in cities like tier 1 or tier 2 cities the depth of doctors is faced only in tier 3 and tier 4 cities and in rural areas and uh, when i was a very young boy i remember my doctors were lmp doctors who were treating almost all types of illness and now we have different specialized doctors with uh, post graduate specialization in specialized disciplines and uh, most of these non clinical specialized doctors they don't practice at all especially a pathologist or a microbiologist he doesn't come and see a normal uh, patient instead he sticks on to his uh, profession of uh, having a lab or something is it a way that um, all the basically bachelor degree holders can be made to practice instead of uh, only those specialists like general medicine or general surgery people taking or uh, to attend the patients sir one thing before you came i mentioned that the shortage is not in tier 1 tier 2 because they all settle down there the shortage is in the smaller cities and the villages because they are unwilling to go there that's one because they have spent a lot of money nowadays medical education is very costly 65% of the seats are in the private sector and the fees in the private sector are quite uh, significantly higher than the government sector therefore naturally from their point and their parents point of view working in village is not going to get that money back for them therefore they are not willing the old system was good when we had lmp because there were no aspirations for post graduation what is now is affecting the medical students is 
MBBS is not enough because the training does not make him feel or her feel competent to manage when they go out of the medical college for various reasons which I mentioned. Therefore, they have to take the clutch of or uh, thing, uh, walking stick uh, of the post graduation, thinking that will make them better. But sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't happen. Now, about the whether the others can work, a better system would be the three-year program of the physician assistant, which is already there. Every corporate hospital you go, the whole unit is run by a physician assistant. From welcoming the patient, maintaining records, filling up the investigation form, taking blood samples, collecting reports, everything is done including changing dressings. The doctor comes around only once in a day because doctors are busy doing other procedures. That is the cadre that we have to focus on. We have to focus on nurses who are much more willing to go a little more peripheral than doctors to work. So we have to see what is the best solution in our environment and adopt it. Because just starting more and more medical colleges from 700 to 1000 and increasing seats from 110 to 2 lakh per year, I am afraid it will not solve the issue. It will not solve it. Another um, point that came to my mind is, see the government is um, coming in to stabilize or um, standardize or uh, to fix up uh, the fees for medical education for even self-financing colleges and self-financing institutes. And uh, as you said, the health insurance is not taking care of the entire need. And uh, recently I had an um, experience I had a sort of illness for which one doctor prescribed a surgical procedure. Whereas the other doctor said, please don't do anything, you keep quiet and drink more and plenty of water, it will be all right. So is it a way that we can, the government can think of um, standardizing the charges for different surgical procedures and uh, expensive treatment procedures? Say, if you say, for example, making a stent and a, you know, in a and a bypass surgery. Why does it cost so differently in one hospital and so less in another hospital? And can't it be stabilized like the way a self-financing medical college has to charge only this? You know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have to tell that. Because if I tell that, I will become very unpopular. And today I want to escape from here without bodily harm. So, it will not happen. It will not happen for reasons best known to all of us. What can happen is, because basically if you see, it is supposed to be a no-profit process starting a medical college. That is why permission is given for private sector. But then it depends whether you are able to enforce it or not. If you make regulations very strict, nobody will start a medical college. They will go and start some other college. So, you have to allow some recovery of investment. So that there is an incentive to start more and more medical colleges because government doesn't have the money. They can convert, they have said they want to convert every district hospital into a medical college. But they announced 23 All India Institutes of Medical Sciences. You know how many are functioning now? Only about 10. The other 13, the land has not been acquired, even in Madurai. The construction has not started. In Bhopal, one batch passed out in All India Institute Bhopal without a hospital. So, policy is one thing, practice is another. Better way of affecting education is to say, 50% of the patient should be at least treated free of cost or at nominal cost. That will increase the clinical material, access to clinical material to students and patients will not refuse because they know they are being treated free and competence will increase. But if you say that fees have to be regulated, I don't know whether it's ever going to work because we have been hearing this for a long time and it will not work. And rare specialities it's really very, very costly. You know the fees for doing radiology, for instance. It is over one crore. 
per year. So then how do you expect the doctor not to do unnecessary procedures after qualifying? He has to recover that one crore. Very sad, but true. That's what happens. Any other interaction from the audience? Uh, I would like from the younger people because I don't know. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm not young. I'm 45 years old. <laughs> anyway, in my mind, everybody is young. That's true. Except okay, me. I'm Balakrishnan from Department of History. Yeah. Though my question is, uh, your your major point of view is about uh, reaching the people unreached. That means to give education, uh, help the masses through the uh, field of medicine. It's actually a sustainable development goal. Actually, in foreign countries, uh, some historians of medicine also go and help to create awareness among the researchers or non-medical students to gain more knowledge about the health practices and medicine so that they also uh, help the uh, larger number of masses through their awareness program or any kind of research. I think so because I uh, like the Facebook page it meant for history of medicine from uh, New York or something. Basically I am historian but uh, I would like to do history of psychiatry. Because history of medicine, science, and technology, I actually like to. I visited Zikmar as well as a patient, but I learned through the process how to uh, learn about psychiatry and all. My point is that if we want to reach the masses, we can't blame the less number of students who are spending more money and have to spend every time to just to serve the society, but they can't get back the money they may. They may, everyone is not uh, super rich here in our country and we have very less number of uh, 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 doctors but more number of patients. For a psychiatry, we have 1% of our country population suffering by psychiatric disorder. And we have to see this is social medicine as a part of in uh, epidemiology or some uh, social, what is called the master of social work course. Is Could you please make it short? Yes, the question so that uh, yeah. time management can be done better. Yes. Okay. So my point is, uh, there should be some historians from social science who should be encouraged to teach history of uh, medicine, like history of uh, something like that. I actually learned by my own interest where, as I was working in the library. I know what is my, meant by anatomy, the structure of body, uh, the body parts, and the physiology is the function of the body parts. This is called, I, we have uh, many things like that. So if many students from social science take health uh, uh, related issue in their curriculum, in their research, if they have interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary approach, this can be helpful. They should be acquainted with all the latest uh, vocabulary of, from other subjects. We should not uh, drive a horse within a small part. We have to go beyond that. Then only we can have a kind of uh, larger uh, understanding about the society. That's what my point is, sir. Thank you so much for that. Good point, sir. I agree with what you said. But there are a lot of operative issues. We'll, maybe if we meet at lunchtime, we'll discuss. It's not so easy. Easily said, but not very easy. Anyway, I'd like to ask you one question, since you asked me one. How was your experience at Jipman? Because I was there for 30 years. So, I want to hear your experience. Sorry, sir. How was your experience at Jipmer? Jipmer. Huh. Actually, I was studying in JNU, New Delhi, and I had some family problems. So, because of that psychiatric, uh, it's kind of schizophrenia, sort of. But it's not uh, that much proper. I have my personal, had my personal problem. Because of that, I went. I used to attend the counseling regularly. Oh, was, was it pleasant? Are you happy or not happy? I gave up getting the... Not, of, not about the uh, disease, yeah. the ambience and the service. It was fine, it was fine. Because it is possible to give good health care at no cost because all the money is spent by central government there, even in our country, if you have the motivation to do so. We used to pride ourselves on giving very good quality care at no cost to the patient. 
but then you cannot do more than what you have. 5,000 people come in a day, very difficult to manage. If it becomes 10,000, the system will collapse. So, there has to be more institutes like that. One cannot be. True, sir. Thank you. Sir, you have time? One or two more? One more. One. Yeah, very one quickly. The last one. Maybe the last question. I'm John Jacob from the Department of Philosophy. My question is, why is the government insisting on making the medicine from the state list to the union list? Do you think centralization will help in providing quality health and well-being, which was aimed at in this conference? Why is the government insisting on making it medicine to move from the state list to the center list? Can it help in providing the quality health and well-being? as was envisaged. Firstly, I am not aware of any movement by government to shift it from the state to the center. No. Only some aspects are with the center. Education is not with the center. Health education is both in the state and in the central institute. So that movement is not happening. Whether it will make it better or not, I do not know. One thing about central government institutes is, which you may or may not agree, practice is not permitted. So, the staff there are 24 hours available in the hospital and available for teaching and available for patient care. Whereas in state government institutes, practice is permitted and therefore after 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon, it is very difficult to find anybody. So, in related question, so, sir. So, it, it's, uh, it's with the service condition, nothing to do with the whether central or state. So, related question. So, what is the role of the private institutions, enterprises in providing such a quality health and well being? So, the government envisaging without the private partnership, you cannot necessarily enforce it, you cannot bring it into reality. Sir, you can better discuss in the lunch, please. Okay, sir. Thank, sir, you, thank sir. you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you. We invite uh, Professor Thiruvarman, our former uh, Dean of Indian Languages and presently Vice Chancellor of Tamil University for his enlightening topic on linguistics, a tool for human bondage, Tamil or classical. I thank the organizer for giving this wonderful opportunity. My topic is uh, linguistics, a uh, tool for human bondage, specifically Tamil, a classical example. You know, India is a nation that uh, honors diversity without uh, working its uh, unity. Despite the numerous uh, distinctions that are pervasive throughout the country, people in India have the common belief that all are Indians and have a special understanding of unity in diversity. People differing from one state to another are distinguished by a variety of traits. Language is one such aspect. There are numerous distinct languages spoken across India. Every language has its unique significance. According to Oliver Wendell Holmes, language is the blood of the soul, into which thoughts run and out of which they grow. Because language is a means of expressing distinct concepts and practices throughout various cultures and communities. It is unique to our species and aids in the expression of sometimes and thoughts. The primary purpose of language is communication. It enables us to communicate with others quickly and easily about our ideas, feelings and thoughts. In addition, language enables us to communicate and comprehend intricate social interactions as well as as success period information, make interferences, establish and achieve goals, 
without language our intelligence would be far lower language is essential to our capacity for thought language language is a way of building social bonds with others cesar chavez says our language is the reflection of ourselves a language is an exact reflection of the character and the growth of its speaker so another crucial component of self reflection is language understanding who who we are and what constitutes our identity is a fundamental component of human development language is also a reflection of culture it allows people to express themselves in a way that reflects their values and beliefs it helps them to understand the world around them both past and present as per opinion of rita brown rita may brown language is the road map of your culture it tells you where its people come from and where they are going language has the power to create connections shift attitudes and tear down boundaries language has been associated with humanity since human communication is more sophisticated than that of other species no other living being exhibits the intricate link between words human utilizes language not just for bonding but also for communication it is true that humanity and language go hand in hand humans have been empowered by language and they have shaped the world with this empowerment language is also essential to other facts of human existence nelson mandela says if we talk to a man in a language he understands that goes to the said if you talk to him in his language that goes to his heart many minority language communities are marginalized because of their cultural background or because their heart language is not the language of power as a result thousands of minority language communities do not have access to education in a language they can understand they become trapped in a cycle of poverty and discrimination simply because they are not part of the majority of language and culture the study of linguistics combats poverty according to roger bacon knowledge of language is the doorway to wisdom the process by which two or more people establish a deep interpersonal relationship is known as human bonding although it most frequently occurs between friends or family it may also occur between groups including sports teams and any time individuals gather together bonding is not the same as simply like bonding is a reciprocal dynamic process it is the process of fostering interpersonal relationships language is the perhaps the deepest bond that humans share outside of blood tamil is one of the longest surviving classical language in the world as you know tamil language is the treasure true of knowledge wisdom and culture ak ramanujam described it as the only language of contemporary india which is recognizably continuous with a classical past the variety and the quality of classical tamil literature has led to it being described as one of the great classical traditions and literatures of the world recorded tamil literature has been documented for over 2000 years the earliest period of tamil literature sangam literature is dated from 300 bc until ad 300 it has the it has the oldest extant literature among tributary languages the earliest epigraphic records found on rock edict and hero stones date from around the 3rd century bc about 60000 of the approximately 
1 lakh inscriptions found by the archaeological survey of india in india or in tamil nadu of them most are in tamil with only about 5% in other languages tamil language inscriptions written in brahmi script have been discovered in sri lanka and on trade goods in thailand and egypt the two earliest manuscripts from india acknowledged and registered by the unesco memory of the world registered in 1997 and 2005 were written in tamil in 1578 portuguese christian missionaries published a tamil prayer book in old tamil script named tambiran vanakkam thus making tamil the first indian language to be printed and published the tamil lexicon published by the university of madras was one of the earliest dictionaries published in indian languages according to 2000 one survey there were 1863 newspapers published in tamil of which 353 were dailies in 2004 a number of skeletons were found buried in the earthenware urns dating from at least 396 bc in adichennalu some of this urns contained writing in tamil brahmi script and some contained skeletons of tamil origin between 2017 and 2018 5820 artifacts have been found in kiredi these were sent to beta analytic in miami florida and accelerator mass spectrometry dating one sample containing tamil brahmi inscriptions was claimed to be dated to around 580 bc john gay states that tamil was the lingua franca for early maritime traders from india tamil being the earliest cultivated language of the world dating from time immemorial ancient lemuria the original home of the tamilians having having been submerged long ago it is vain to look for archaeological evidences in support uh, of the antiquity of tamil civilization and culture it must be definitely understood that oceanography and geology have taken the place of archaeology in the case of tamil nadu under this situation the tamil language and literature alone constitute the, the sources of material for reconstruction of pre christian and pre aryan history of tamil culture the classical the classical language and literature should be distinct from the modern and uh, there may be also be a discontinuity between the classical language and its later forms of outputs the government of india by its october 12 2004 order designated tamil as a classical language since tamil meets all the requirements of being a classical language the richness and the beauty of tamil language are unmatched and unparalleled according to george hart california berkeley tamil is extremely old as old as latin it arose an entirely independent tradition with almost no influence from sanskrit or other languages its ancient literature is indescribably vast and rich tamil has very rich literary heritage and a long literary tradition spanning more than 2500 years and maybe far older than that the history of tamil literature is an integral part of the history of tamil nadu and closely linked with the social political and cultural trends of the various periods <coughs> antiquity and uh, evolution of tamil literary conventions having very large history this is um, it's not a time to uh, describe all those things huh? simply uh, i will explain about uh, tolgapiya tolgapiya is uh, work on the grammar of tamil language and uh, rhetoric and the oldest book in tamil available today the author is tolgapiya tolgapiya is divided into three three parts one is phonology uh, that is elithadigaram morphology and syntax soladigaram and the subject matter of poetry is purladigaram in purladigaram tulgapiyam writes grammar for poetics 
Tamil is the only language in the world that describes such a grammar. Since grammar books are usually written after the existence of literature over long periods, it is obvious that a significant amount of literature could, be, could have preceded Tolgapiyam. There are over 250 references in the Tolgapiyam which provide a substantial evidence of the existence, existence of many classical and grammatical works in Tamil period to Tolgapiyam. Moreover, it should be noted that before the literature from which these literary conventions were written, there must have been a time when the people lived this life. P.T. Srinivasa Iyengar in his book, History of the Tamils from the earliest to 600 AD in page number 63 states that at first the Bard's poetry was a true mirror of the life led by the people of that time. Later poets kept up the traditional imaginary of earlier ones. These traditional poetic images were later crystallized into literary conventions. In ancient Tamils divided the habitual parts of the earth into five natural regions. Tolgapiyam names these uh, regions as follows. Kurinji, that is uh, the hilly country, Mullai, the wooded land between the highlands and the lowlands, Pali, the dry waterless regions, Marudam, the lower courses of rivers, the agricultural land. Nairal, the coastal regions which is which is creates the sea. Srinivas Ayangar in the same book History of Tamil concluded that the early culture of the Tamils must be very ancient and must have started a few millennium before Christ. This makes the Tamil language and culture extremely old. According to George Hart, Tamil constitutes the only literary tradition indigenous to India that is not derived from Sanskrit. Indeed, its literature arose before, before the influence of Sanskrit in the South becomes strong and so is qualitatively different from anything we have in Sanskrit in other, other Indian languages. Tamil has its own poetic theory, its own grammatical tradition, its own aesthetic and a large body of literature that is quite unique. About 88% about of the population of Tamil Nadu are Hindus. Christians and Muslims account for 6% and 5.5% respectively. The majority of Muslims in Tamil Nadu speak Tamil, which is less than 15% of them reporting Urdu as their mother tongue. Tamil jail number of only a few thousand now. Atheist, rationalist, and humanist philosophies are also adhered by sizable minorities. As a result of Tamil cultural revivalism in the 20th century and its antipathy to what it saw as a Brahmanical Hinduism. Tamil Jains constitute around 0.13% of the population of Tamil Nadu. Many of the rich Tamil literature works were written by Jains. According to George Hart, the legend of the Tamil Sangams or literary assemblies was based on the Jain Sangam at Madurai. The temper and the tone of the Tamil language soup and uh, uplift the soul. The Tamil language is a testament to the resilience and the creativity of the Tamil people. The Tamil language is a living legacy that concepts that connects the Tamil people to other groups. The melodies and the rhythm of Tamil language resonate with this world. Tamil is a language of poetry that captures the essence of life. Tamil language is a testament of the power of linguistic diversity. Tamil language is a vibrant and a dynamic language that has survived the test of time. The Tamil language has the power to connect people, communities and cultures. Tamil is a symphony of sounds that dance on the tongue. Tamil is the voice of a thousand year old civilization. The influence of the influence of Tamil extends beyond borders as it is also spoken by the Tamil di diaspora residing in numerous countries worldwide. 
recognized as one of the 22 scheduled languages in constitution of India, Tamil holds a distinction of being the first classical language of India. Tamil has the contributed words to various languages, showcasing its influence beyond its own boundaries. In English, several words have their origins in Tamil. Some instances include derived, derived from Kurtu meaning rolled mango organizing from Mangai. These examples demonstrate the influence of Tamil words in the English language. Understanding the fundamentals of learning Tamil is crucial if one hopes to establish a strong connection with the diverse Tamil population that lives all over the world. Engaging in local language talk usually strengthens the relationship between people. Knowing Tamil increases one's exposure to the rich literature of the Tamil language and forces relationship with fellow Tamils. Tamils are well known in the community for their knowledge in science, math, and code of behavior. Learning Tamil provides, provides them a world of opportunities and its literature is rich. Tamil culture is vital and it's, it is our duty to, as a native speakers of the language to preserve, preserve it wherever we go. It is our responsibility to teach the new nuances of the Tamil language to our children and the children of the future. With this uh, short information, I conclude and uh, once again I thank the organizers for giving the opportunity for, for sharing the, some of the information regarding our own language and also what's the role of our Tamil language for all the aspects of uh, communication and other uh, knowledge transformation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I thank again on behalf of all of uh, the delegates and the university staff, Professor Thirudu, uh, Vice Chancellor of uh, Kainju Tamil University, for an nice elaborating lecture. Again, just to open up the discussion, uh, as a person who loves Tamil, my observation is the young generation, present generation. Once I was uh, outside doing a postdoc, uh, I could see the Europeans loving to learn other languages. An Englishman was very much eager to learn German or French. A French guy was eager to learn uh, uh, Spanish. And I was a candidate for uh, FAO officer position when I, it was possible for me to make up to the end and finally they said the candidate should be knowing one more European language other than English. Since I was not aware of uh, French or German, I couldn't get into that position. So there is a passion among the Europeans and other uh, nationals to learn other languages. But now with the young generation of India, Neither they are very much well versed and strong in their own native language. For example, Nama youngsters in Nerepiri Tamil or Tamil Solabuda or other. But at the same time, they also are reluctant to learn other languages. What is the cause behind this attitude? Why are they neither interested in learning their own language nor interested in learning other languages as well? Thanks, sir. So that. Uh one of the major activities of our Tamil University is uh, the Indian diaspora. Almost uh, 165 countries around the world, we are uh, conducting the courses, grade level courses for uh, culture as well as language. Because the Indian diaspora has very, very, very long uh, history that the engineer is not able to follow that our own culture, even though the parents are uh, not uh, eager to uh, communicate or uh, pass the cultural and the other uh, language aspects of our own mother tongue, parents' mother tongue. The, so that our Tamil University started a different type of courses through Tamil Panbatu Mayam and Tamil Varalavalar Mayam, up to degree level courses for 165 countries and we are conducting preparing syllabus and conducting examinations and giving the certificate to the young generation of Indian diaspora in various uh, countries. It's one of the major duty. And also, being a Tamil uh, mother tongue people, we have to 
meet in when when we when we have two Tamilians are uh, meet in a Delhi, they are not uh, able to speak in Tamil. It's our culture. But in Kannada people, they meet or any any type of language people they are meeting with. They used to communicate with one can only Kannada. That is uh, mother tongue of affection. So that uh, as our uh, honorable vice chancellor statement is Tamil mella chagu. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I open up the discussion. Anybody else interested in driving questions? Sir, Vice Chancellor Tanjatan. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. What are you Tamil. Yeah. Tamil Mudal Nul Tulkapiam, the Tulkapitil, Embernard Plor, Enba, and the Karthagal Varindana, Adunde Karthi and Naya. And the Sulada and Baza or Tulkapitla Posulika, Embernard Plorna, Pedia Sound Rogel, Sulla Suluar Hell, Ipita Sulonga, Pedia Paragong and Rata Slovak. Namade Tamil Mum Parmayana then. Ini kumun tulga bet kumun adiknya mana nol berindir kena, adanya ini dah kerjut untuk maya. Ada, ada tu orang expert solir kare, abdi ramai dah solar. Karena adik punya itu mana sengaja lekang ni lekang kuri, nol nol tenggelai pas dah tulga peru orang lekang nol lewa raya itu. Ini lekang nol nol adiknya mana yang berindir kena, adik aku pol lekang nol nol adiknya mana berindir kena. Berindir kena, berindir kena. Mereka pun permainan nol, permainan Tamil, ini artam pelajar niya. Alah, begini, kalau ira ayam mandel itu mana dah kau bayar, anda lelaki itu tuan tak pernah dah kau alah alah solusi. Nanti ya. Nanti. Thank you sir. I think we can conclude this. Sorry, orang ni macam bal basket. I am sorry. Sir again for Tamil University Vice Chancellor. See, English has grown up by adopting words from other languages. Many words in English are Latin, Greek, even Tamil words are there in English. And uh, how do you view that if Tamil wants to grow, whether the language is to adopt words from, of course, we are, we are now adopting. Allah me kani Tamil, Allah me pani da, and mara da trakde. Enna pani trakinge, na BA pani trakhe, muchte na pani puringe, na law pani la trakhe, enna pani pani ayi chhe. So, so that way, that way, do you think that adopting other language words which are mostly used? Will pay way for uh, growth of the language, or will it be intruding into the purity of the language? Yeah. Nalla kelly, you the Tamil Nadu Tamil Nadu Tamil Nadu Tamil Nadu Tamil Tamil Nadu 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 Tamil Yen dan da mudi kelilo, yen dan da subjek matematik, law, yadil erkodo, adukaga, perindu eta montru urua, agi ada agaradi kel, beli bandu kudu erkodo. Ila, sokkal nuda walam pergan ada, uru mudi nuda walam pergo. Adi mandha mudi lerkod sokkal ada, mana ada, pamit perit tu ader kala wai pulu. Maru tu magatam, puri yelagatam, ada tan sira. Adi unno adat katama ga inda, perikar aras epna panir kono, kaluri, panggale karaga tuk, uru workshop mai mana lapor. Oru oru English language jo, oru Telugu Telugu mana, mana modi kel nuriya, oru oru textbook aku lgi. Anu fitin five days la, anu mana mana, awalnya create panu. He had to create a word equivalent word for a Tamil word for that other language. Anu pera modi lgi aku lgi, awat eki, thariyana oru Tamil chole, awu terang lgi mana, awu mandu mana tu kor dano, wawa tu seiyo. Palay Malay lgi lgi aku lgi, Tamil lgi lgi lgi, anu anu terang terang mula mula. Kawan oleh mama kita, ada yang lebih panji, kondo itu, yang ada kuriya, irubati yang lelak jam sorkale puja orang orang kita. Hei tak mana? Ada kata, kami mahu ikut mana? Inno balam serikat orang yang ada, ada kata, nama kami mereka modal macam tu lirik kami, kami pergi ikut kali way lekor mana orang ke, apabila proton, na proton boleh tak? Proton mana boleh tak? Tu yang kami lekor kondo itu boleh tak? Ada mari, turut kali way orang. Malu tu kali ni, Tamil itu kondo itu kanan. Muih cik itu kereta kereta, ni ada pun terbaik lekar. Tapi Tamil pelik lekar, pun perlu tu ni pelik lekar. Anak leh, 
தமிழ் கல்வி அதாவது தாய்மொழி கல்வி ஒன்றுதான் சிறந்தது என்பதற்கு இது ஒரு நல்ல முயற்சியாக நாங்கள் நினைக்கிறோம் We would like to honor the distinguished speakers of this particular session. May I now request our esteemed Vice Chancellor to kindly come forward to honor our first speaker, Prof. Ananda Krishnan. Please, sir. Now, our esteemed Vice Chancellor honors uh, Professor Vaitavi Alluvan, Vice Chancellor of Tamil University. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, we'll now break for uh, lunch. After the lunch, our third session will start exactly by 2 p.m. and I request all the registered participants to remain